Hello there. This is Ellie from Spitfire. We'll get started in just a minute. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Hello, is that Ellie? That, this is Ellie, yes. How are you doing? Doing great. Good morning. Good morning. Looks like so we've I, got 17 folks so far. Do you want to give it another minute and let folks join, or you want to kick it off? Sure, we'll give it another minute or two to let folks join. That'd be great. Okay. Great.
All right, well, maybe we'll go ahead and get started. Um, okay. Maybe some more folks will join us, but we'll go ahead and get started and do a little intro. Um, but that way they won't miss some of your content since it'll be a minute or two. Uh, okay. So, everybody, welcome to this webinar calling Good Food Messaging. My name is Janine Knight, and I work with a team of folks in North Carolina on a multi-organizational initiative called Community Food Strategies. We work to support and empower local food councils and networks across our state. There's about 35 of them, 36 of them right now. And mainly we work around resource development, coaching, and networking to help them positively impact their local farm and food communities. Um, so as I'm kind of giving you some context and introducing this webinar, I'd love for all of you to get familiar with the chat box and just introduce yourselves with your name and your organization and if you're affiliated with uh, local food councils. So that way we just kind of get a sense of, of who's here. Be great. So um, as a part of our work and the work of local food councils, we really encourage cross-sector dialogue and conversation to broaden the perspectives of the food system. And we know that everybody experiences this world differently and that each of our lived experiences and perspectives contributes to a more nuanced understanding of how food and farming impact our communities. And so since all of you work in food and farming, you're pretty well aware of how our current farming models and food distributions impact our health, our economy, our natural resources, and overall equitable communities. And we've heard from food councils and experienced this ourselves that um, it sometimes can be difficult talking about healthy food and farming advocacy because it's somewhat complicated. And as many of you probably know, I've heard of it as a, a wicked problem and that it has um, multiple solutions and requires lots of different people in the game and lots of um, creative thinking. So in this, in this world, communications is really important and we have lots of different audiences. And so when I learned of Spitfire Strategies Good Food Messaging Guide, I was pretty excited and intrigued to learn more about their research um, on Americans' attitudes on food and farming policy, and then their recommendations for how we talk about it. Um, our team has done a lot of work on shared language this year, and really know that the words and phrases we use in rural communities resonate differently from those of us in urban communities, and vice versa with other audiences. And we know that communications and how we talk about our work is super important, whether we're just, we're organizing, we're involved in advocacy, we're fundraising. And we also know that sometimes it's not our first priority. And we hope to encourage <laughs> that um, you think a little bit differently about that. And then you take some of these tips and techniques that Ellie is going to share with us today and see how you can weave it into your own work. So I'm happy to host this with Spitfire. Um, just as a little framing for the day, we're gonna hear from Ellie um, as she presents their work. And we're also going to encourage, um, we'll have a little Q&A afterwards. Um, and then we're gonna break up into breakout rooms and have you all talk with each other about what you've heard and share some of your thoughts. We always know there's a lot of expertise in the room and we want you all to, to continue to network, learn from each other, um, and also share what's resonating with you. Um, I encourage you to use the chat box. Thank you all for doing it already. It's great to see so many folks in the room right now and from um, a lot of North Carolina and across the country, so that's great. Um, so post your questions in there or any resources, relevant links. Uh, I'll also remind you that at the bottom right-hand corner of that chat box, there's a little button that says more, and one of those options is you can save it. Um, to your desktop. So at the end of the webinar, you can save the chat and any resources and links that we have posted in there. So um, to introduce Ellie and Jackie um, and Spitfire Strategies, for those of you that don't know who they are, they're a woman-owned communications and strategic marketing firm based in DC, but you guys have hubs all over the country. Their work is really rooted in social justice and social change. 
and you guys have an impressive amount of clients ranging from um, World Wildlife Fund, American Farmland Trust, Planned Parenthood, Amnesty International, and the Kellogg Foundation. It's quite the gamut of different clients. And so I'm thrilled to have you guys here. Um, Ellie is going to be presenter, and Jackie is also here from Spitfire. And I'll let you guys take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jenny. I'm so excited to be with you all today. It's really fun to see everybody chatting in where you're from. I'm, I'm slightly partial to North Carolina because that's where I'm from. So <laughs> fun to see so many North Carolina folks, but we welcome everyone, obviously. <laughs> Um, so let's get started. Thanks a lot for that great intro, Jenny. Um, let me advance our slides. There we go. So we've already done some introductions. And like Jenny said, we're going to talk you through this good, good food message guide. I'm going to give you a little bit of background of how it came to be and why we developed it, and then um, actually walk you through it. And then we're also going to um, have a nice question and answer period, so you'll have a chance to really um, ask some questions, we can have a discussion with all of us, and then we'll break into breakout groups um, using this fun Zoom technology where you can um, set up groups where you can just talk three or four of you with each other. I'm actually going to turn my video off just because I get distracted looking at myself, but I'll turn it back on. <laughs> I promise I'm not vain. It's just weird to see yourself when you're talking. <laughs> all right. Um, so well, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background here. So our strategy um, was really developed in collaboration with um, a, a bunch of different folks. So we work um, with a coalition that we call Farm to Fork, which is um, a coalition of advocates and organizations. Our other lead partner organization is called Arabella Advisors. They're also based here in DC. Um, but the coalition is made up of folks that work all across the food space. So think nutrition groups, hunger groups, folks that work to protect the environment, sustainable agriculture, uh, so you name it, it's probably represented at this table. We've been working for about two years with this coalition, and our goal is really to advance and protect good food policies, and we knew in order to do that, we had to really be able to expand the base of support for these policies, um, and in, in order to do that, we had to figure out how we could build support amongst moderate policymakers and their constituents. So this research I'm going to talk you through is really um, targeted to that particular audience. So everything here you'll hear is really to help you communicate better with um, moderate folks that might be interested in food. So a little bit of background. We did some research with two um, polling firms. So one is called um, Public Opinion Strategies, the other GBA Strategies. One is um, more progressive, the other more conservative. Um, and they helped us put together four different focus groups in Pittsburgh and Kansas City back in early 27, or early October of 2017, so right around about a year ago. Um, and what we learned from those focus groups, we then applied to a national online survey of about 1,000 voters. And those voters were really representative across political and geographic spectrum, so we had a really nice representation to get some um, really comprehensive results. That also happened in October, later in the month in 2017. So again, about a year ago. And then from those um, two research tools, we put our um, smarts together with our, um, the expertise from our two public opinion um, research firms, and we came up with this message guide. So that's what we're gonna talk you through. But before we get there, I just wanna give you a few takeaways that we learned from the research. So really interestingly, um, a majority of voters already recognize that access to healthy food and food insecurity are really serious issues in our country. And that to me is very hopeful. It shows that like folks, we don't have to do a whole lot of education, right? Folks already realize that we're up against some serious issues and they're interested in figuring out solutions. There was also a high level of awareness, also good news, about um, the way we grow our food and how it might affect our environment. So that's great for those of you that are interested in the environmental impacts of our food production. Um, also interesting, this one was very interesting to me, is that a majority of voters, including a significant number of Republicans, are actually open to increased government regulation on food. Um, 
for those of you that work with more conservative audiences, that may surprise you as well, because we know that that's not typically something that conservative audiences are open to. They tend to be against government <laughs> regulation. And we'll talk about how you want to actually talk about that with your, in your messaging as we move on. Um, and then also voters were initially um, or not initially familiar with good food policies. But once we really talked about the policies and defined what they meant, then people really started to like what they were hearing. Um, and then also referencing those good food policies. So you want to make sure that any definition of the policies really emphasizes food safety and nutrition. And you'll see how we do that in the messaging as we walk through it shortly. Um, very interesting, two groups that were noted as being really trusted messengers, so they would be good spokespeople for you, are farmers and mothers. They definitely won out as some of the most trusted folks. Um, and then followed by doctors and nurses. Um, maybe not as hopeful for you. Um, locally grown food turned out to be more sizzle than steak, as we like to say. So voters were actually a lot more concerned with their food being affordable, nutritious, and safe than they were it being local. Um, and then finally, this probably does not surprise you, those of you that are used to working with conservative audiences or even moderate audiences, one of our biggest challenges that we're going to um, figure out how to face with this messaging guide, and we've got some guidance in here, is that um, is this argument around personal responsibility. So that's very often a frame when we talk about moderates and conservatives. Um, so we need to figure out how we can make it clear that good food policies really give voters the opportunity to make better food choices. And the key here is choices rather than those being forced on them. Right, so people want the opportunity to make the choice. And you'll see that reflected a lot in the messaging. All right, so let's dig in. We're gonna go through a lot of guidance here. So we've broken our guidance down into four different steps. And I'm gonna walk you through sort of the, the ins and outs of those as we go. Um, first, we wanna talk about really tapping into a sense of pride and the belief that our food system is should be and really can be the best in the world. Um, this is super, interesting to me that the frame of pride actually won out in some of the ones that we tested. So we, we also looked at health as a frame, safety as a frame, um, the moral obligation to do the right thing with, uh, in our food system as a frame, but pride really won out. And so you want to make sure that you're always um, tapping that sense of pride. And so I'm going to break down some of the different parts of this message. So we see from farm to fork, our food system should be something we are proud of, making the safest and healthiest food available for everyone. So let's break that down a little bit. When you think about from farm to fork, this phrase is actually super important for you to use um, because it really helps define what we mean by food system. When you use food system alone, people weren't really understanding what we meant by that. And this, this just a simple phrase from farm to fork really conjures up the right connections for folks so that they understand what we mean by food system. Then again, you want to tap into this element of pride. It's a really key element with these audiences. Um, they want, they're really eager to feel a sense of pride and of the fact that America is special. And not only special, but also the best. And that's where this sense of the safest and the healthiest food comes in. You can also use or sub in most nutritious if that's something that is more important to you and your messaging, but you want to make sure you've got that superlative, right? We, we aren't just special, but we are the best in America. <laughs> um, and then this last point is also really, really important. So you want to make sure that you are making this connection that it's available or accessible to everyone. Um, you don't want to leave this piece out because it's really the bridge between, you know, a gap between hunger and nutrition and equity. And if you're thinking about an equitable food system, obviously you want it to be available for everyone. So you want to make sure that you include that piece about everyone. All right, so that's our step one. Then you really want to think through um, how you can, once you've established what this vision of a good food system is, you want to make sure that then you're tying the food policies to that. So your food policies are your path to achieving that vision of a good food system. And a couple of ways you can do that here in this blue box will give you some sample messages. So 
a world-class food system that works for all American families is built on good food policies. Those policies are measures that strengthen a healthy, fair, and sustainable food system from farm to fork. So see there that reference from farm to fork that follows the food system. So you're really making that connection for people about what the system is. And then another example could be good food policies include improved food safety, healthier farm practices, and great access, greater access to healthy food. So you're tapping those values of safety, health, and access. All right, so step three, once you've really defined that your policies are that connection or are that pathway to your vision, then you wanna connect the policies with those food values. So safety, health, affordability, availability, those are all things that really resonated with folks in our research. Um, and so one way you can do that is actually talk about a particular policy in that way. So if you use, there are some examples here in those parentheses, let's take the farm bill for an example. You can say the farm bill is the best way to put strong protections on how our food is grown, manufactured, and labeled. So we can all be confident we are putting the safest, healthiest food on the table. There are a couple of things to note here. Remember how we talked about folks were actually open to regulations by the government? Notice the word regulation is not mentioned in this blurb. So we replace it with protections. You want to think about not actually um, triggering a negative connotation for these moderate audiences. So think about using the word protections instead of regulation. So it's a good example of a substitute there. And then this last example, if you let's substitute SNAP for our um, policy that we're talking about. So the um, SNAP is how America makes healthy food more affordable and accessible so that everyone has the freedom to make the choices that are right for ourselves and for our families. So note here a couple of things, particularly when you're talking about SNAP or some sort of food assistance program, you wanna talk about it being made accessible to folks. And, and you'll see here that reference to making the food choices that are right for them. So you're not providing food assistance, you're allowing folks to make that choice. And that's a very small difference, but it makes a, a big impact when you're talking to moderate audiences. And then finally, you want to tie it all together, right? So you're, the last step in this message guidance is to really frame your ask as a step towards a world-class system. So a good example of that is tell your elected leaders you want a food system that we can all be proud of and will make affordable, nutritious, and safe food available to everyone. So notice there you're tapping that available to everyone. This message sort of brings it full circle. All right, so let's talk through some do's and don'ts. I've mentioned these as we've been going, so forgive me if I sound like a broken record, but they're all really important to note. So you want to think about who your best messengers can be, and we absolutely identified that farmers and mothers are really good messengers. Um, they came across as really credible for folks that we surveyed. Uh, you also want to talk about affordability, availability, safety, and nutrition. Those were four big values that came out in our research that folks really care about. You want to avoid using the word food system without giving that context. So you always want to have the little phrase from farm to fork there so that you cue for folks in their minds what you mean about food system. And then you also want to avoid implying the government is making choices for families. And here's another um, great example of what to avoid. So these programs provide healthy food to families. That word provide is what's really tricky here. So you want to think about giving them the options or helping them make the choice. You're not actually providing them with healthy food. And that's something that's really hard, particularly for me, because I've always done a lot of progressive messaging and that's something that we use a lot in the progressive space so you want to you're going to have to break yourself of that habit when you're talking to more moderate audiences all right i'm going to pause there and see if anyone has any questions you can either chat them into the chat box or just unmute yourself i think if you want to ask a question i'll turn my video back on now that I'm not distracted. 
Anyone have any questions? Ellie, I just wanted to ask if you all um, have a link to your guide on your website or is that something we can share with folks in the chat or um, after the webinar? You know, it's actually not on our website, I don't think so, but we definitely have it as a PDF that we can send around to everybody. We've got everybody's emails that registered, so we can do that for sure. Great. No questions? I'm surprised. <laughs> Oh, I do see something coming in. Let's see. Well, I thought I did. Oh, okay, here we go. So Lauren has a question that says, my new committee is very is a very mixed group of more liberal and more moderate. How do I balance what I'm asking and how I'm framing things? That's a really great question. So I think you want to think about how you're talking to both of those groups separately. Um, you definitely can use this messaging. It doesn't hurt with a more liberal audience. We, um, it actually was tested on liberals as well and it worked just fine. You may want to, if you are able to communicate separately with the more liberal audience, you can definitely tap more of, um, a food assistance message that folks might be more um, might find more resonant for them but it doesn't hurt to use the moderate messaging with progressives it's not something that turns them off so if you're in a situation where you have to talk to both at the same time then then take the moderate route but I would also encourage you to really think about how your group can serve as messengers for other folks so if the moderates can talk to other moderates or the liberals can talk to other liberals, then I think you can think about how to actually use those folks as messengers themselves and test it out, right? You can take this message guide and, and have a discussion about it with your group and see what really resonates with folks and what doesn't. It's a great question. Any other questions? You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so one more question from Lori. It says, in your experience, does bipartisan really make a difference? Tell me what you mean about make a difference. Do you mean when you're coming up with policies, do they need to be bipartisan or have bipartisan support? Okay. Um, so it really matters which legislative body you're talking about. I mean, if we take the farm bill, for example, right now, um, the Senate side of the farm bill is absolutely bipartisan. They did a lot of negotiations and um, sort of conversations before they actually released the bill. And it had, it had overwhelming support in the Senate. It passed like, I think it was 86 with 86 um, yay votes, which is unprecedented in the Senate, obviously. Um, and on the flip side, the House is super partisan. It was only developed by the Republican member of the Ag Committee, and that's why things are really stalled in the conference now when we're trying to conference the House Farm Bill with the Senate Farm Bill because they didn't do those negotiations in advance. So the bills are very different, and it's now, I'm sure you all know that the Farm Bill actually expired September 30th, so now they're looking at having to do the conference um, of the two bills in the lame duck session. So when you're working in um, a really partisan environment like our federal government right now, then I think it is really important for it to be bipartisan. Obviously, if your political calculus is different, you've, you know, you've got a super progressive um, hold on your local legislature, then go for it and try to pass as much progressive legislation as you can. But um, I do think that's probably not the reality for most of the folks that we're working with. Monique says, what is the best language to use to talk about gaps in the food system that negatively impact disadvantaged populations or communities? That is a great question. So that's really where the, if you, let me go back to these message points, where this um, for everyone language really comes into play. So when you're talking about making 
affordable, nutritious, and safe food available to everyone. That's why we say you always want to play up the everyone piece because that's what, how you're going to make that connection to equity so that you're really um, talking um, on behalf of those disadvantaged populations. I also think it really depends on who you're talking to. So you can, if you're talking to more progressive audiences, you can really talk about how the system is set up to not benefit disadvantaged populations, right? But when you're talking to more moderate audiences, that could um, send people or have them put up a wall immediately to what you're talking about. Do you want to talk in more, um, more inclusive or available to everyone language? Does that help? Great. These are great questions. Anybody have anything else? So nice they're coming in one at a time, too. It's like you guys have done this before. <laughs> All right. I don't see any coming in. Feel free to keep chatting in questions as you have them, um, and we can answer them when we come back. But, um, Jenny, I will pass it over to you if you want to talk through the breakout groups. Okay, great. So um, thank you, Ellie, for sharing that. And I hope that you all will take a deeper dive into the PDF when it comes our way. Um, it's a helpful tool to have around and just as reference as you're working on your messaging. So um, as I said before, it's helpful to just start thinking about this and talking about it with others right away. So we wanted to um, for you all to break out into groups of three or four, briefly introduce yourself so you can meet someone new. Feel free to turn on your video if you're comfortable doing that. That's helpful to put um, a face with a name. And then we're gonna ask you to answer these questions. So first we want you to think about what parts of the messaging really resonate with you. So reflect on your experience first. Um, and then go to what parts of this messaging do you think will resonate well with your audience or with your community? So thinking about um, a particular audience, so if it's elected officials, new volunteers, partners, funders, um, whichever you, you think you're going to target right now or think about. And then we'll keep these um, questions up as well. But the second thing we want you to, to think about is what are the opportunities coming up that you could weave in some of these messages or phrases um, and help each other brainstorm about what that might look like. So that can be in your newsletters, it can be on flyers, your social media posts, um, fact sheets that you're handing elected, elected officials and your reports, or really just in conversation with new partners or elected officials or funders. So think about where you might use this um, and how it can support you there. So before you run away, um, and if you haven't been in breakout rooms before, you're gonna get a little pop-up block on your screen that asks you to join a breakout room, and you're gonna have to click yes or join or something um, to actually go to that room. And then once you do that, you're gonna leave this main room and you'll be joined with a couple other people we're gonna give you about 10 minutes um, to discuss these questions. And then you'll get a, a notice when you're about one minute is up and then we'll all move back to the whole group, um, do a quick debrief and see what came up for you, see about some further questions and then do a wrap up. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? Thank you, Shannon. We'll share the PDF with you. She's gonna run off. Um, so Jackie and Ellie, whenever you're ready to break us up, feel free. And we'll see you all back here in about 10 minutes. Great, I will create the rooms right now.
conversation. Um, let's see. All right, I think we're all coming back together. Can everyone hear us? All right, how did it go? How were your discussions? Anything, any aha moments anybody had they want to share? Feel free to unmute yourself. Did anybody talk about a particular audience that they want to share this, with us? This is Monique Bethel. I found it very, I found a, a, it was a great aha moment um, when talking with, um, with, with um, Karen of our small group about language that we use in terms of, um, like for example, she gave, she gave an example of what the city of Baltimore uses in terms of priority food areas versus using things like food deserts. And she mm. described it as saying that it food the name food deserts assumes that there's a natural it's formed as a natural phenomenon versus a man made phenomenon, and so I really liked that um, just that that switch in the language there. So that really did resonate a lot with me. That's great, yeah, because then it, it implies that it's not something that's created by a system, right? Or it's something that's just occurring naturally, and there's no one responsible for that happening. <laughs> that's a great, great thing to share. Thank you. Anything else that folks talked about? Who were some of your audiences that you were thinking about whether this messaging would resonate with? I know you guys aren't shy. <laughs> we got kind we of a chat discussion. Um, so Lauren, La Lauren doesn't have a microphone or video, so she can't actually share it. But I, I will just share a little bit of that. I would love to hear what other people share say, but. Some of her audience right now is speaking to city officials and folks in City Hall, and they've changed some um, of their urban zoning recently. And so she said that she's framing a little bit more um, about framing it as like small investments in community that will give them more options to support themselves. And she's also talking about it more as placemaking. And I think that that speaks to some of our conversation about trying to just develop pride in the community and feeling like you're really belonging. So she's curious about what other folks think about that. And we didn't have time to respond to her, but I think it's a great way to talk to city um, officials about it, particularly because it's a little bit about um, economic development and it's a little bit to your messaging around um, having choices and, and feeling like folks can do things for themselves. So mm -hmm. I'm curious what other folks think about framing it as small investments in community, supporting each other, and placemaking around urban agriculture, urban zoning. I like that. What do other folks think about it? Anybody had a similar experience in their communities? Grace is asking, is this like micro grant? I don't know if you know the answer to that, Jenny. And Mon um, Monique says she's not sure what placemaking means. Can we clarify what placemaking means? Um, I'm just gonna, this is Grace Canoeing with Davidson County Local Food Network. Um, so for me, the idea of placemaking is a place where people can come and join or feel a community. So it's like a base. And so for me, like a community garden or even an urban garden is somewhere where people can go to, like just on a fundamental level where they can find people with similar interests or a place that, um, where a groundswell can occur to affect change or whatever it is. 
that's my understanding of place making. Um, I'm not sure what other people uh, understand that to be. Um, and to I ask the question, is this what she ta she's talking about, like micro grants? So in our area, uh, the food councils were given the opportunity to apply for a micro grant, and it's smaller grants, 1,000, 200,000, 3,000, 4,000. And, um, and you sort of state, it doesn't have to be a grandiose project, it's just something that helps catalyze something you might be thinking. And so I'm just curious about when she was proposing that to the elected officials, is it who is eligible? What are the confines of, like, for example, what stops people is they might not be a nonprofit. So how can they ask for that money? Or is, because if you ask them to be a nonprofit, I think that might be a barrier for certain communities not having to go through that process. So I'm just curious how they would um, propose to do that in terms of method. Because that would help me be able to go to the city officials and say, hey, you know, there's this new idea. Because I know each city council gives money to certain organizations right now. And so there is a pool of funding to things like downtown revitalization. But I'm not sure how to propose something she's talking about in a non nonprofit way to people who are just a grassroots organization. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. Without having to make them like be established as a 501c3 or a legal nonprofit organization. Yeah. Lauren, do you have an answer for that? Lauren says, um, I don't know how it works outside of Erie, but we call them community based organizations. And do they have to be like established nonprofits? Or can it be sort of like an informal organization? <clears throat> Lauren says no, but you have to establish that they aren't going to dissolve. Okay. Does that help, Grace? Yeah. I, I just... I guess they have to say, you know, these are the qualifications of um, an applicant, I guess. Okay. Yeah, and maybe show some history and stability as an organization, it sounds like. Thanks, Amanda, for putting some more, another article around placemaking in there, and then Karen referencing some of those grants as well. That's, that's helpful. Great. Ellie, I have a question for you, and I was digging into the guide a little bit more. You guys talk more about um, farmers and mothers being great messengers and then you also share on the don't side of things that grocery stores and food companies aren't often great messengers that they're least trustworthy um and i think that i remember reading in there somewhere even restaurants so i'm curious if you can dig deeper into that because i know we have a lot of really great chefs that are um really work in the food movement pretty well and, and are kind of like our celebrities, you know, celebrity chefs. So I'm curious if you can talk more about what you've learned about not using grocery stores or food companies and potentially if that restaurant component was something I made up in my brain or if that was in there somewhere. <laughs> I don't remember the restaurant component, but I can <laughs> dig back into some of the, because I do think chefs are, are really helpful because they can talk about how the system works from farm to fork in a way that a lot of other folks, it, it, it really resonates with folks. Um, I think food companies in particular didn't resonate because people saw that they had some sort of skin in the game, that they were more worried about their profits than necessarily about like, um, you know, like labeling nutrition labels in a way that makes it um, obvious what is actually in their food or, um, and I think grocery stores in a similar way, maybe not 
to the extent of um, companies where they they're more concerned about profits, but they're just I think they're seen as part of the system. And the the more that they're like bigger entities, like in the same way that like when we say farmers, a lot of times folks talk about family farmers as opposed to like big agribusiness because then um, like the bigger um, I think the company gets people start to think more about corporate greed than they do about their um, their actual interest in creating a good system. I'll dig into the restaurant piece. I have to agree with um, Jenny. I used to work with um, a culinary school and as part of my um, position, I was really trying to connect the culinary world to um, the community, you know, organizations that work on food policy and food systems and the public health world, because I do think that we spend a lot of time talking about the farm to fork, but we don't spend as much time on the fork side as we do on the farm side. And I think we really need to start bringing the culinary world into these discussions and make them a part of what we're doing because I think they do have a very strong voice and they are, you know, people who are generally respected in their communities as well. So I think I'm still working on how to effectively do that um, and, and bring these two worlds together. Yeah, I think that's a really smart um, strategy that you're thinking through. Because I do think, particularly when you think of smaller sort of family owned restaurants or chefs that, you know, own their own restaurants, not like the big chain restaurants, um, they, they are also seen as like local business owners and part of the economy. So that also is really helpful when you're talking to um, moderate policymakers. So I think it is really smart to, and they, they often already understand the food system, right? And they understand a lot of equity issues when it comes to the restaurant industry in particular and the hospitality industry when it comes to paying people fairly and, um, you know, you get into all of the economic policy parts of the food system. So I think they can be really great messengers. You just want to think about which one it is that you're doing because there are folks like Jose Andres, who I love, who is a big D.C. chef but he is absolutely associated with the left and the progressive movement. So if you're thinking about um, trying to tap more moderate folks, then you want to think about folks who also um, would be the right messengers in terms of their politics. If they're very outspoken on the left and then they may, they may not resonate that well with your moderate folks. Well, we are, we have about, Three minutes. Are there any any last things? Oh, Jenny, I see your um, note that you found re- we connect restaurant owners to food companies. Gotcha. And grocery stores, not the chefs. Yep. Any other last questions? So we will definitely circulate the guide for you all. And I would go ahead and save the chat if you are interested before we close out, because there are definitely some good links in there that Amanda shared on placemaking. You are very welcome. Thank you for the thank you messages. (laughs) Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Ginny, do you have any closing thoughts you want to add before we end? Um. I just want to say thanks again for you and Jackie for being here and sharing your um, guidance with us and excited for you all to learn more and dig deeper into guide and just like use this as a reference when you're talking about it. It's always helpful just to um, think about how we might talk about our work and also our particular audiences. So it's a shout out to dig a little bit deeper and think about your audiences and how you can communicate with them a little bit better. Um, so thank you to everybody else and for being here and um, have a great Friday afternoon, everybody. That's all I got. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.